Uh, the multiverse of wrestling madness is officially open. The forbidden door, the prohibiting portal is now all wide open for everyone to cross through because uh, tonight's going to be very, very interesting. But hi, all you BC WrestlePod nerds out there, and uh, welcome to a live rendition of the Grapple Gurus, your pay-per-view and PLE review teams for all of the promotions, whether it be WWE, AEW, TNA, or ROH. All the teams use this to review any pay-per-views. We've got one coming up tomorrow for Clash of the Castle, but tonight we are going to be reviewing TNAs against all the PLE and this is the final pay-per-view before we start the road to our next tent pole for TNA. It's Big Four with Slammiversary, which we'll talk about a little bit. But I am your host, Mikey. I am part of the TNA review team, your Impact Authority review team, also known as El Jefe around the BC Wrestle Parts. I'm the man with half the plan and the face that kind of runs the place. And get ready because the Forbidden Door is not just with our host, but it's going to be all summer long, having lots of people be popping in and out. So that's, I'm super excited. But joining me tonight, not to Will, not to an Andrew, but coming through the Forbidden Door for a one night only ECW appearance and performance, we got JBL, one of the hosts of Just Our Three Gents and the Biconic Review of Honor Teams as well as our aficionado for those pay-per-view review teams for AEW and ROH as well. I'm going to be honest, he is here because he owes me a favor. But I'm always excited to get new people to check out the weird world that is TNA. And also, you know, we're going to we're gonna go back and forth because uh, JBL has said some things about TNA in the past. So I'm ready for him. I'm just kidding. JBL, I know you've been busy, so thank you for doing a solid for me. And he's either muted or just giving me grief. So this is giving fantastic. grief because this is what I'm just doing. Like the show we were on tonight, watching this is just to, to set it all off for you folks. The joke's gonna be basically this: Mikey, would you like me to he to speak as if I was actually on this pay per view for this entire thing? I mean, sure, why not? So I'm gonna speak back here so you can <laughs> barely hear me. And it's going to be echoey because the mics were terrible. You couldn't see the video. I don't know what else is going on with it. Can you pick me up here? Jeez. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be one of those nights. But I'm excited to have JVL here because outside of the technical issues, which I agree with him, I'm excited to talk about because there were a pretty, couple of matches I really enjoyed here. And also, we're going to talk about some other things as well, because uh, I thought that TNA was in a bit of trouble because we didn't have anything planned past the August tapings at the beginning of the month. And then the floodgates opened. They're like, just kidding. Here are the next two pay-per-views for August. And for September, I was just like, oh, Lord, here we go. And for contracts to be signed by Endeavor and getting all that stuff set together, you know it's all about that. Oh, absolutely. For sure. But before we get into the review, just like we always do here at the Apple Gurus. Uh -oh. Yep, there we go. All right. So this is more for people watching at home. Let us notice, notice. No, no. We are thrilled to invite you to dive into the world of wrestling with us at BC WrestlePod. Your opinions and insights are what make our wrestling community vibrant and diverse. Whether you're a longtime fan or new to the scene, your perspective is valuable. However... When sharing thoughts or commenting, let's remember to keep the conversation respectful and supportive. Wrestling is a passion we all share, and it's in our spirited discussions that we learn and grow together. So let's celebrate our favorite moments, discuss the incredible matches, and maybe even debate the outcomes with kindness and respect. The short version of this is taking words from Brian Zane over at Wrestling with Regret on YouTube. Like what you liked, don't be a dick. That's all I am asking. Don't be a turd. Don't be rude in the comments because you will be blocked, booted, bamboozled. You lose. Good day, sir. I just find it funny when they're rude in the comments because it takes so much effort for them to do that and so little for us to ignore it. But now that we've gotten all of that out of the way, let us begin. You know, I love using StreamYard because I get to use these pretty graphics. It's <laughs> great, Mikey, when you can use graphics like that. Oh, this is going to be an interesting, but we are here to cover TNA's Against All Odds pay-per-view that took place Friday, June 14th from the Cicero Stadium in Chicago, Illinois, which was, yeah, Chicago. We, it was a sold out pay-per-view, which is kind of crazy to see. So let's begin. So we're going to start off with the countdown show because we did have two matches that happened on the pre-show and each match was varying degrees, of, you know, enjoyment and some moments, but 
let's begin with our first match that kind of kicked off the countdown show. Sure. We had a singles match. The Death Machine TV host and Death Machine God himself, Sammy Callahan, taking on this darker Cthulhu-esque version of Jonathan Gresham. I love the mask. I don't care what nobody says. It's been a really interesting thing. But we had this opening match, and uh, we had spent like five minutes of them trying to kill each other before the bell even rang. So that that was something. I wasn't surprised this was going to be a, a hard-hitting match in general. Sammy Callahan is just a messy fighter in general, and that's not a bad thing or a good thing always has been even from the solomon crow days back in xt and seeing jonathan gresham work this new character into what he's doing he's tapping into something that still is kind of percolating in other companies i don't know how long it'll last him in this because it has a shelf life but it was entertaining again the obvious technical issues we started off with on the countdown like i just it took me out of it because i couldn't pay attention yeah and you know for those of us that watch tna on a consistent basis which is really weird because the pay-per-views seem to be the only times we really have any problems with the technicals, but that's because it's live where the actual TV episodes are always pre-recorded and pre-taped so they can figure that out in post. It just is always hit and miss. It depends because Rebellion, well, then again, Rebellion was at the Palms in Las Vegas, so they probably have better stuff there because the Palms is, you know, anyways, that's besides the point. Yeah, but but the Cicero runs like independent shows all around Chicago. That's all what I was gonna say. Yeah, not made up for it. So this was TNA's own technology that failed them in multiple ways. And I, I, it's almost as if they stuck like room mics in the room and then tried to run it through the board, and it didn't make any sense. They they, they just didn't have the right channel picked up. I, I I would fire everybody in their truck right now. Yeah, I was like, people in the truck, just you get about to get fired. Well, the more in the interesting bit about this match, I really enjoyed it, but of course we had to have some weird shenanigans because Kushida comes out like it's the pandemic still, which, you know, the story that's being told, anytime that Jonathan Gresham has a match, the refs now all have to wear gloves and masks so they don't get the black, you know, ink coming out of their it's mouths. It's yeah, <laughs> so... Kushida comes out ready to go and he collects a sample said black goo, which then which is enough to distract Jonathan Gresham to allow Sammy Callahan to pick up the win here. So now they are one in one, which means to tell me we're going to have a blow off match in some capacity. And I'm kind of looking forward to it. Jonathan Gresham won the first encounter. Sammy won the second. So now we go to my favorite rule of three. We're getting a third blow off match. This should be fun. I'm interested to see in the coming weeks how Kushida analyzes this goo. So TNA is full of camp, and we'll get to the campiness yeah. in a little bit. As I said, TNA is all camp. Basically, this is a full-on soap opera. I'm assuming the next time it's going to be either like Sammy Callahan's going to either inject himself with a vaccine for it, or he's going to inject Gresham, something to revert him back, and still lose to Gresham. So Gresham's winning the next round no matter what. Yeah, I think Gresham definitely needs to win this one. But, you know... TNA surprises me from time to time with its decision making. So we go from this match to probably one of my, you know, top two, top three matches of the evening. This was on the countdown show because I love all four women here. But we had a the countdown. We had the knockouts world tag team championships being defended. We have our champions, Alicia Edwards and Masha Sitch taking on, you know, Allison K and Marty Bell of the heck. I mean, you see <laughs> Allison and Marty so much. I love these girls so much. They're so good. This was very entertaining. Like, I, I, I always knew the knockouts division could carry itself in a lot of ways, and the tag division also has been kind of, like, you know, up there. My MVP of the match was Masha Slamovich, of course, because she really carried pretty much everything in here. But this was a very entertaining match, and in a lot of ways, more entertaining than stuff we got the rest of the weekend, which is even surprising. Honestly, you are not wrong with all that. And I continue to say, for as small as their knockouts division is, TNA does a good job of utilizing all the talent they have. Now, of course, I wish that their tag division was more built out because right now it's Alicia and Masha. We have the Hex. We also have Danny Luna and Jody Threat as their tag team. And we had Decay, but Havoc is out. So, but Rosemary, who we'll talk about later, is kind of doing a solo thing right now, which I'm actually excited for. Because uh, we talked about it on the TNA Go Home, Rosemary seems to be on the collision course with Ash by Elegance as we look at the end of this pay-per-view as well. But that's that's later on. But Alicia and Masha retained the championships. This was a really good match. I'm like, oh my gosh, a women's match that goes more than 10 minutes? Who knew? That's crazy. 
Oh, we knew. I was just the thing that got me about this entire evening was it really killed me. Was the crowd was so dead throughout. I was like, "Come on, Chicago!" It got, and, and it got worse and worse through the night. I don't know whether that's TNA's audio issues in the room and we didn't hear it, or just in general they just were mild. But this it, again. I came into this after watching a taped version with you like a little while ago, and this was leagues different. Oh, definitely. But Alicia and Masha retained the championships, so one-third of the system have retained their titles, and we only have the, the two-thirds left in the evening to see if they would walk out with their titles. Spoiler alert, it went the way that you exactly thought it was going to, but yes. we now leave the countdown show, and we have reached our main card which opens up with a really fun tag team match. We had the bitter enemies of Mike Santana and Steve Macklin taking on Zachary Wentz and Trey Miguel of the Rascals. We've been getting this feud because Santana and Macklin have beef with each other. Santana made his debut at Rebellion back in April, beating Steve Macklin in that match. And so they've been fighting on and off. Last week, they had a match to kind of settle the score, which was interrupted by the Rascals, who have beef with both Santana and Macklin. So the enemy of my enemy is my friend type of situation where they're a one and done teaming up to take care of the Rascals, and then they can go their separate ways and do what they need to do. I am so happy to see Mike Santana be happy to wrestle again, and especially if anyone has watched the Chris Van Fleet interview knowing that he took some time off to go get clean which is really nice so he's physically better and then emotionally and just mentally and also in a better place as well i want macklin and santana to be fighting all the teams left and right but this was a fun one this had everything i wanted santana and macklin are your heavy hitters and the rascals are doing fast acrobatic flippy things which i'd love to watch from them always normal for them and i've seen the rascals before in a couple of other uh, tna episodes and all that stuff so we knew what's going in here i know i'm behind on this and i looked this up afterwards but i'm like oh, trey miguel why do you look like ricochet but with hair it was very strange and i know it's a, it's a known trope it definitely is well, one of the things that we say on the review, too, is because the Rascals, anyone who pays attention knows that their entrance, you know, they have the coughing and then the smoke. I was just like, yep, that's what we're going for. But then it was kind of wild to watch them. I was like, sir, there is vape coming out of your mouth. Like, what is happening? As we said before, Trey Miguel does the best thing ever, which is to prove that you're a good person by smoking a vape pen in the worst part. He's a, he's a child. They're both children. That being said, they got their asses whooped by uh, Mike Santana and, and Steve Macklin. I could see this where this is kind of a, a like a, a, a back and forth thing where like Macklin and Santana don't wrestle again together for a while. They're going at each other, other people. They then get attacked again during one of their matches by another tag team. Just every three or four months, they come back together to beat down the tag division to go back to have feud in themselves which could probably kill their tag division if they wanted it to, but that's basically what they're setting them up for. Yeah, but See, and we talked about this when we were talking about the Knockouts Tag Championship match. The men's tag team division, I'm never worried about because there's like twice as much, if not maybe 2.5 as much men's right. tag team since there are women's. But I also, for some reason, like the thrown together tag teams also work in TNA. Like these two were thrown together for this match only, and then they can keep coming back because they're both similar styles. Macklin and Santana are both more heavy hitting brawler types. Macklin is, I guess, more calculated in his stuff, but yeah, Mike Santana is straight up. I grew up in New York. You about to get this boot, and I'm like, I'm here for that. Yeah, he's a but, bit more reckless. Macklin, Macklin is measured. Yes, exactly, which balances out, and ultimately it worked in their favor because Santana and Macklin picked up the win here. There was a sign of respect afterwards, and the two went their separate ways. I am happy that Mr. Steve Macklin re-signed with the company because I like him here. And honestly, outside of, spoiler alert, his wife is trying. They're, she's trying. We knew it was going to happen to her when she came into the company to begin with. We knew this was about to happen. But yes, she's doing her best. Yeah, she and Thunder had a really fantastic no DQ match on Collision this week. It was actually really good. I just wish it wasn't eight minutes, but you know. that We've had that talk for a very long time. But this was our first match. It set the tone for the evening. Not only an action movement, but again, I, I keep harping on this. The technical issues brought it away. You lost commentary. You lost other things. You were having trouble hearing. You were hearing spot in the ring you weren't supposed to hear like it was all over the map and it took me out of caring as much for it which i there were times where i just kept looking around like okay what else is going on no pay attention to the match which there are great things happening these guys are working really well and i couldn't 
my ADHD brain couldn't deal with it. That is very fair. But we move on from this opener. And you want to talk about camp. So, yes. <laughs> All right. Oh so we could quickly go through this match because it went exactly the way that it was supposed to. Next up on the card, we had our French Canadian Frankenstein monster, PCO, taking on Rich Homie Swan over here. That is AJ. The Frank intros Frank. were longer than the match. Yes. So. This match really happened because on the go-home show, because this whole entire thing, PCO is kind of fancying Steph Delander, which is, we'll get to her in a little bit, because she is one of my favorite additions to TNA right now. But PCO is like high school crush on her. And last week, or two weeks ago, gave Steph Delander a note. We like, do you want to go on a date? We oui or no? I didn't even say so, that. I just said PCO, question mark. We? Oui? No. no. And so on the go-home show... Steph was with Zaya Brookside telling her, you know what? I'm going to give PCO the answer at Against All Odds. Which then prompted AJ Francis and Rich Swan to take the rose that PCO gave Steph. They brought it out to when they did the promo. PCO attacked. This is how we got this match. Again, you said this. The intros for both of them were longer than the match itself, but I knew what I was getting into when this was made. This was more so to continue to get PCO wins, and honestly... The match is not what we were here for. It served its purpose to set up what happened afterwards. It did. And you know what? They did what they could. PCO is as stiff as ever because he's a monster, but also he's in his 60s. And Rich Swan did his best to, to work around him the best he could. AJ Francis being a distraction at ringside. It's your classic older wrestler doing his stuff and a younger wrestler trying to carry him through with a little help. Nothing to write home about at all. Correct. So PCO picks up the win here, but then the best thing happened because then Steph DeLander's music hits. She comes out. She has the note. She's talking to the crowd and PCO. And ultimately, she says, we. So PCO and Steph are about to go on their first date. This is going to be so camp. I'm here for it. If it can live up to the pandemic era, I'll be surprised. But this will be very interesting to see where this goes. Because it isn't like big Big, he's not Connor anymore. Big K, big, big Kurt. What, what the hell is his it's name? It's just now? Con now. <laughs> big Con, you know, who's a, who's the who's he's not a redwood as much as he's a giant elm here. Basically, is uh, Steph Delander's second now because Matt Cardona got hurt. Yeah, that technically is still true, but it seems that we've kind of separated the two for a little bit. So Steph and PCO are going to be a thing. I feel like Zaya Brookside's going to be involved in this capacity in somewhere. Now that she's finished with her feud with Ash, it's fun. <laughs> and, you know, Steph, I like Steph Delander. And she enjoy she seems to be enjoying what she's doing because I thought she was only going to stick around until for a couple episodes of TNA. But now, just like another person we're going to talk about later in the evening, she's kind of just sticking around longer than I thought. I was like, I ain't going to be mad, especially if we continue to get her in the ring. <laughs> That open prohibitive portal might keep a lot of people around longer than you think. All right. <laughs> so we move on from this match and we go into our next one, which... Hey, it's Dolph Ziggler. So we have the TNA World Tag Team Championship match next. We have the system being represented by Brian Myers and Eddie Edwards taking on the Hollywood hunk. Ryan Nemeth and the wanted man Nick Nemeth. So the Nemeth brothers versus system. Oh, no. Yes. You know what? Good. And I've oh. said this over the last couple of weeks. Good on Ryan. I was just like AEW wasn't doing anything with him. So now he's gonna join his brother in TNA. And I'm like, I'm here for it. I do if this was a good match. It really was. And it was what I did not like this match at all. It was by the numbers for a lot of it. It was way too long for what they had going with it. And the Dango flip. That part. We'll get into that. Yeah, I'm sorry. It just, it's not that it was badly wrestled. These four guys can wrestle. Alicia Edwards is also hysterical in her thing. There were no stakes. Yes, the titles were on the line, but it didn't feel like any of them were like wanting to be there. Yeah. And the thing is, is that we've been building to this match since, well, the last, since Rebellion. Because the system and Moose continue to go after the Nemeths and specifically Nick and Broken Matt Hardy and Speedball Mountain are getting caught in the crossfire. So I'm like, okay, so this is where we're getting. I hate to say this, I because Nick and Ryan have been tagging in other tag team matches leading into this. Those matches wrestling wise were better than this. I just felt that the oversaturation with all the shenanigans from, you know, what's expected to be Alicia, so that's not what knocked it, but Dango was absolutely not needed here because he had no involvement in the build-up to this match anyways to begin with on television. I was like, 
sir, why are you here? He needs to get on TV because at some point he's going to run across Tyler Breeze in that prohibitive portal, and they've got to have him together. That's crazy. It just, like, it could have been anyone in the back to make sense, and it didn't. And at the same time, the action was slow, which is surprising for a Nick Nemeth match and, you know, and all that stuff. And it, again, it seemed like it was just kind of like we have to do, like it was a C-level pay-per-view for them where we got to do this, but honestly, I just not feeling it tonight. I don't know if I want to. Even when Moose came down, like half-dressed for his match, like he, it just, it felt like it was like, okay, we're hitting our spots now. We've got to be on camera at this point. Got to make sure we hit that. All right, let's get to it. Let's finish this match. It's it's going through as planned. whoop de doo Yeah, I was a little underwhelmed by this because I know how great all four of these individuals are by themselves and even what tag teams, I mean, our tag team champs. I love Eddie Edwards and Brian Myers. They're really good in the ring. It's just, a, just Dango didn't help and then they didn't click with a lot of this. So I was no. just like, man, well, that was a disappointment. But because of Dango system retain their championships we will see where this goes because now that we're heading to slam anniversary which is the next big four pay-per-view for tna coming up in july i'm interested to see if we put nick back in the title picture for moose even though he failed to capture it at rebellion do we have them continue to go after the tag team titles i'm hoping that tna will give the nemeth something tangible to do because there's also a whole line of tag teams waiting to happen. You have ABC, Speedball Mountain. Like, we have other tag teams waiting in the wings. So I'm hoping that if we're going to give the titles to the Nemeth brothers, let's make the storyline more tangible. Or do something at all. Because that's the other part is that, you know, Moose wasn't a fan of Dango. So I guess they're showing dissension in the ranks. It just was over overcomplicated for no good reason with this match. Yeah, so I was underwhelmed with this match. I love all the talent involved, but just it didn't click for me. Well, and if you're going to have Dango be like involved in the in the system storylines, he should have been involved more than once. Over yeah, the- not, not tonight. I was just like, well, anyways. So the system, Alicia and Masha retained their titles. Eddie and Brian retain their titles which means that there's only one person left in our main event to retain his but we which move on from the main event yeah i will tell you what should have been the main event when we get i agree with you I, I, should have been. I hope you are right but we'll see so we move on from this tag team championship match and we get into our next singles match of the oh. evening where we have joe hendry being you know accompanied by brawl out superstar ace Steel, taking on the, the king of tna frankie the bite his ass chants were just awesome the entire they time they were amazing for that alone but, i was just, just like i don't care about the match that made me happy now mikey you said his name he didn't appear yet but i believe in joe hendry i believed yes. in joe hendry since wcpw <laughs> so this was a fun time for me and getting the full promo at the top kaz giving him the room to do that with Chicago believes in Joe Hendry as well. They believed the entire time, and wrongly so, because he lost here for some reason. Yeah, that's my biggest critique of this match, because when we did our predictions, me, Will, and Andrew in our little Google form, we all picked Joe Hendry to win because... I I pick predictions on this. I'm the one doing this. I mean, that's also very, very fair, but the prediction... The predictions league is for those of us that will do these on a consistent basis. I mean, you do it for AEW and ROH. So, well, mostly for AEW because ROH only has three pay-per-views a year. Yeah, but I want to do the WWE ones too because I just want to see if I can beat you guys without even watching the product. But either way, I will this say, to happen. Kaz did not need to win this. No, Frankie Kazarian can take a loss. And I know I've not been the biggest Frankie Kazarian fan the last couple of months for his character, his personality, and his out of ring personality and his in ring work is never questionable to me. I no. hate this character though that he's the king of TNA. I hate this character, and so I was like, okay, well he's gonna get his butt handed to him. Joe Hendry needs to have a win here because he's been kind of getting on the short end of the stick, getting beat down. The last he hasn't won weeks. a match in a while. It's been a hot minute. Well, I mean, he did beat Eddie Edwards like two weeks ago, so he got laid out. I was like, oh, never mind then. And- Meanwhile, his work in the ring is stellar. He and Kaz had good chemistry. The stalling suplex was insane. Woo, like, that was beautiful. He's definitely getting better in the ring. Like, push- I don't know why companies don't push people to the moon when they get themselves over organically. Yeah, and I'm just like, Joe Hendry is 
a wonderful talent. He's in ring is so good. He's so entertaining. He has the whole package. Let's do so. Don't have him lose to Frankie. Nothing against Frankie, but like Frankie can afford a loss. Joe Hendry cannot. I'm sorry, Frankie. You're on the downswing of your career. You can afford a loss or three. Yeah. At least you can move in the ring a little bit better than your tag team counterpart over in the other company because that is why he is not. (laughs) Yeah, Corporate Daniels. Check out the ROH and AEW reviews about Corporate Daniels. That is always fun, too. But it is fun. I just. Yeah, I, I still believe in Joe Hendry. I worry that the shine is going to come off him if he loses anymore and doesn't follow up with this whole thing. Because if you're just a song in an entrance, you're not going to last that long. No. Well, and then the weird thing happens, too, because after the match, Frankie Kazarian, like, decks Ace Steel from behind and Ace punches him, which then we get later in the evening that this upcoming Thursday, or at least somewhere in these tapings that are about to happen, Frankie is going to have a Chicago street fight match with a steel. I was just like, <laughs> they're going to have a spot where he bites him. You know where there's going to be low key though. If he kind of, if he does bite him, I was like best match 10 out of 10. I'm not going to, I hope the Chicago ground continues with the bite his ass chance. Yeah. The ending sucked the wind out of the sails for me. Cause before the ending, I was like, this match is actually pretty good. I like this match. A great match. The, the, it was entertaining all the way through. The, there was pacing that was really well done. Kazarian got his fire back and took Hendry out a couple big times after not being able to knock him down. Hendry got a couple big power move spots that really sold that he was about to do it. And then it just out of nowhere fell apart. Yeah, Frankie didn't need to win here, but Frankie does pick up the win. We're getting Ace Steel versus Frankie in a Chicago street fight somewhere in these tapings. No Hendry. I still believe in him. He needs to win. All right, JBL. Bird the loins because we're going to talk about my match of the night. Sorry, what was that? I couldn't hear you <laughs> about how much you hate Chicago and how much oh. we're going to hate everything about this. We get into our X Division Championship match next. We have our reigning X Division champ, Mustafa Ali, taking on the challenger, Daddy Trent Seven, as he's known here. But like, this was let's let's get it out of the way first. So Trent Seven Please. tries to cut a promo, but the mic and the feedback was awful. Oh, no, and, the mic for Trent Seven was fine. The video was terrible. Oh, that video audio was trash. So Trent Seven exposes Ali. We learned in this leaked video that Ali's not even from Chicago. How did you learn that? I had to pay attention really, really closely. And I, I put my ear up to the monitor. Because the crowd was yelling, we can't hear can't you. hear you. Yeah, exactly. And then we don't believe him or we still love you. Yes. I was just like, see... The technical issues ruined what could have been a really fun thing before the match started. Because then when that bell ring, woo, child, they went at it. <laughs> and they were hoping Trent would be the babyface in this, but they couldn't be because no one knew why he should be the babyface. That is very true. But Trent and Ali put on a classic for me. This, oh my God, this match, they made me believe. I'm like, oh shit, maybe Trent might actually win this. Never, right? We got so many false finishes from both of them. That they're hitting all their finishers like each other's finishers. That was, yes, I was like, oh my gosh. It, this was my favorite match of the whole entire evening. And to me, this should have been the main event. This was my main event for Against All Odds. 100%. I'm with you on that one. I, it was going to be for that or the Jordan Grace match if it went well, but it didn't. So this is where I'm like sitting like, yeah, this is definitely what should have been there, even with all the technical glitches. I'm put, I put this in my list of matches to consider for the top for our end of the year podcast. Like, here's my top three matches of the year. Your top 73. I mean, that's also very true. But Ali... Ali has some of the cleanest splashes in the business. That Those things are a thing of beauty every time he hits it. And it Trent like Seven... Yeah, go seven. ahead. Yeah. It, just, it looks even cleaner against Trent Seven, who can sell and take up space without moving. Like, he's amazing. Well, on top of that, too, the Birmingham, the Birmingham Hammer always looks great, too, from Trent. Yeah. I'm just like, oh, that thing is so beautiful. Also, what pushed this over for me to be my favorite match of the whole pay-per-view is the in-ring storytelling... That Ali continued to attack the damaged knee of Trent throughout this match and would not let up. I was like, that is how you do heel work in the wrestling ring. I mean, you put him in a sharpshooter, for God's sake. Like, seriously. Oh, my goodness. And Trent kept selling it. It was like, oh, my gosh, my knee. I well, played the main event. This was my favorite match of the whole entire evening. Ali walks out, still the X Division champion. And at this point, I still think we're on a collision course. Ali versus Speedball Mike Bailey is going to slap. I certainly hope so. 
I hope so. Give that to me at Slammiversary. I'm here for it. I'm also happy to see that Ali has stuck around longer than I thought he would too because he was only scheduled for six appearances beginning in February. It is currently June, and he has held this championship for almost 200 plus days at this point. Which he doesn't care about, apparently, according to the video. I love that Ali gets the flowers that he finally deserves because other company did not utilize him the way that they should have, and now he gets to do this global domination with this character. I love it, but... Again, I'm hoping that at Slammiversary, it's going to be Ollie versus Bailey. That match is going to be great, and I can't wait. I bet but, you can't. So then, and I talked about this with the Dolpho on the Go Home Show, because next we move into a fun tag team match that had some questionable spots, though. And literally, the build to this was non-existent. It doesn't help that Josh Alexander has been out since Rebellion with injury, but now he's cleared to come back, so... We kind of just threw ABC into here. So we have Josh Alexander and Eric Young, Team Canada 2.0, taking on the team of ABC, Ace Austin, and Chris Bay, two of my favorites in TNA right now. And this was a tag team match, though, and you know the spot that I'm going to talk about as to why we needed to be here, and I have many, many questions. So at one point in this match, while the referee is distracted, we have Chris Bay... Tug on the maple leaves, Josh Alexander, who then answers, you know, tenfold with it. And Chris Bay was screaming. He almost hit the falsetto. He almost hit the Mariah Carey whistle tone. But like, I don't know why that spot happened. It did not need to happen. And I'm like, Josh is a face. So what? That was a weird spot. But it it seemed like an audible garner heat for some reason, because ABC was getting cheers throughout this entire thing, even though, you know, like Eric Young comes out in a Dr. Doom mask and all that good stuff. But yeah, ABC seemed was getting over farther than those two. And they were like, the, the dynamic wasn't working. So I guess they went to resort to that as their backup plan, which made no utter sense at all. And the referee, again, the refs in TNA, some of the easiest distracted and also easiest taken out as well. Yeah. I'm also like when I texted you yesterday too, I was very surprised by the outcome. Cause I was like, oh, okay. So Josh is back. So Josh is going to win. No ABC pull up the victory right here. I was like, I'm like, I'm not mad, but <laughs> I was confused because ABC looked like they were breaking up the last time I watched TNA. So now they're working together. Okay. So here's what you missed. So they were having issues. They had a one-on-one -on -one match. They worked through issues. They had a couple tag team matches, and now here we are. My biggest problem with this match is that I like all four people who are involved. I like Eric Young. Josh is one of my favorite peoples on the planet. He had an awesome trilogy with Alex Hammerstone the last couple of months in TNA, which is Big Hoss versus Big Hoss. And ABC are probably the best tag team in TNA right now that they got because both styles blend very well. My biggest issue with this match is we just had it just to have it. I was like, okay. I was like, well, Josh is coming back. So this is probably just going to give Josh a win after, you know, being gone for a little bit from injury. And then ABC won. I was like, okay. I was like, where are we going? We're sending up Josh versus ZY down the road? I don't know. Maybe. All I see is what the Mama's Boys wishes they were. They don't have a Maria Canellas to tell them that. They just do it on their own. Exactly. It's also really weird, too, because they stopped promoting them as part of the Bullet Club, but they're kind of still Bullet Club as well, which is also a weird thing. But, you know, War Dogs have kind of, like, excommunicated all the other members. So. Right. So it's very interesting. But ABC picks up the victory here. This was... a. Uh, Tag team match, I enjoyed it, but the Maple Leaf spots kind of was like, okay. Thank you. No, yeah, thank you. I, was, I was like, mm. Alrighty. So before we get into the rest of this evening, commentary also let us know, be like, hey, guess what? The summer of TNA is not over because they run down everything that's about to go down, but I'm only going to talk about the important bits. They mentioned that the next time that we have a pay-per-view for TNA is going to be at their next big four, which is Slammiversary taking place in Montreal, Quebec, Canada, Saturday, July 20th. Me, Will, hopefully going to be watching that live. JBL, as a side note, July has just become stacked with pay-per-views. There's like so I much know. going on. And that's the only one coming near me. I could go to that one if I wanted to. But you're not a T. I know. I was just like, we either need to all get to Vegas because... TNA seems to be going to Vegas a lot this year. Or if there's anything in Texas, me and Andrew have agreed that we're flying out and all three of us are going. But Slammiversary is happening. Yeah. I was just saying, for those of you wondering why I was doing this, and Mikey, I think you know why I was doing this. During this entire promo, Matt Raywald is sitting there talking about stuff and some jerk behind him is throwing bunny ears behind his head. 
making like he's jerking off his head, playing with his head, and Matt's no selling it, but it was severely distracting. I'm just like the thirteenth, the, the Friday the Thirteenth show always end up being so weird in TNA. I'm just like something always goes down. It's gonna do more because it's got an impact taping right after. Seriously, but it makes me, Andrew, and Will breathe a little bit easier because we weren't sure. Because outside of the tapings in August. We're like, TNA doesn't have anything, and we were hearing reports that they don't have anything planned. Well, now we know why, because now we have secured Emergence and Victory Road. Super excited. September's going to be busy, too, because we have TNA's Victory Road, and then we have the CMLL Anniversario show. for. And we're heading into Survivor Series season. God, it's going to be a busy fall, but I'm excited. So now that we got all the promo stuff out of the way, let's get into this. She is my goddess. She deserved better. But, so much, and for many reasons, including the dead. I no felt bad for boys. her. I felt, so we have a TNA Knockouts World Championship Open Challenge match. Jordan Grace issued the challenge on the Go Home Show. She doesn't care which anyone from any promotion could come in to do this. Uh, did you hear the chants before who came out? Yeah, I'm and, like. And the crowd yelling them down at the same time? I was just like, this poor girl. But anyway, so. Jordan Grace is defending her title. She gets into the ring. We have Josh Alexander's wife, who is now a ring announcer. Love her. She's great. But she announces that the challenger is from NXT, Miss Tatum Paxley. So, okay. I want to preface by saying this. I love me some Tatum Tot Paxley. I love her so much. As somebody who has been following her journey alongside Andrew and Will, we've watched Tatum. We love Tatum. I already knew this wasn't going to be a five-star classic because Tatum is still very green and she still needs to work on a lot of stuff. And I'm okay if JBL completely disagrees with me with here, but I feel that Tatum got given this opportunity and I'm just like, maybe we could have picked another NXT women to kind of go up against Jordan. But I also think that this was really good for Tatum because she did everything she could with what she know. And Jordan definitely carried her in parts of this match. But I don't I don't blame Tatum for this. Since TNA and NXT are having this crossover like working relationship. I wasn't expecting Roxanne to come on over to face Jordan since we already had that match. But I was thinking of, I don't know, maybe. And what's hard is, is that the people I would normally say are now on main roster. So that kind of limits who we're going to get. But honestly, I would have seen maybe somebody like, I don't know, Sol Ruka, a returning Wendy Chu. Like someone who has been in the business for a little bit longer and also can go. Because Blair Davenport, they're on main roster now. So yeah. I'm just like, hell, Tatum anybody did... that was anybody that was in the the women's North American title ladder match could have worked. Oh They've my been God. on TV, have a following. This is to me proving that this this transactional thing they're doing is not equal both ways because Jordan goes over to NXT to get exposure on the third brand and she's the champion, but they're going to send one of their greenest athletes back over to TNA to wrestle a match with their champion because we don't care. We don't want to do that, and like the there's going to be no bump in re, re, you know viewership from this. There's not going to be nobody drawing over because I love to Tatum Paxley. She did a great job for what she had. She, no one knows who she is. So what is the point of this? Right, and okay, so I'm gonna probably get some hate from this. I don't know if we're saving her for Slam Anniversary or whatever. Depending, I think I know who Jordan's facing at Slam Anniversary, but who knows? I would have taken. Honestly, that'd be kind of fantastic, but I doubt it. But. You know, as much crap as we give her, I actually would have rather seen Jordan versus Natalia. Honestly, someone with name recognition. Honestly. Now, again, unless something happens, I think Jordan and Ash are going to collide at Slammiversary or something's going to happen where Natalia and Jordan should clash at Slammiversary. Slammiversary always ends up being where everybody and their mother come in. This is where a couple of years ago we had Thunder versus Deanna of all things. We had Mia Yim make her debut at Slammiversary last year. We had Trinity, aka Naomi, like when she debuted for Slammiversary and beat Deanna for the title. Like Slammiversary is always where things go down and people debut. So unless we're getting Natalia and Jordan, I I think it's Ash versus Jordan at Slammiversary, which is what the tale we've been telling for the last couple of weeks. But Tatum did the best she could. Jordan did the best they could. Ash by Elegance was there. She was the Listen, I can't root against our girl now, especially after interviewing her. I was just like, yeah, I can't root against you. Because <laughs> her concierge is a piece of crap. 
like IRL or just character wise? It seems like in, in real life. I have no idea. But Jordan and her finisher still is just like, oh God. I was like, yes, I love it. But also, ow. If you miss that by a hair, you're killing somebody. Oh, absolutely. But Jordan Grace beats Tatum Paxley, well, retains the title, and she beats the, up Ash by Elegance afterwards. The muscle buster was also scary because Tatum is so much bigger than Jordan. Yep. But yeah, like I said, Jordan versus Ash is probably the direction we're going for, but who knows? All righty. So now, talk about JVL's favorite match. <laughs> oh, God, I tuned out of this match. I It was boring for a, for a no rules, no holds barred match. I'm gonna I be have honest. Never been bored before. I'm gonna be honest. All the stuff they did at the Hardy compound at the Go Home show was like ten times better. Honestly, they could have had that be the match, like cinematic match, instead of having this. To me, look, I know Matt Hardy is a legend, and the broken character, the wrestling fandom loves to death. I love me some broken Matt Hardy, but this is TNA. I don't know if it's because Matt is getting up there in age he can't really do all the crazy stuff that he used to in his youth but this was like the safest no disqualification match moose was trying moose tried but there was a lot of start and stop to set up spots and i was like y'all are killing the momentum for me you look back and people are like oh matt wasn't getting pushed tony khan didn't like what he was doing with them he had no idea what to do with the hardies no he knew you can't use them for anything anymore they maybe have one good match left in them if you give them six months to recover, and they should save that to be a tag team match against their old rivals, which they can't do now. And Matt wants to keep wrestling. He doesn't have the gas to do it anymore. His body is broken. He is broken, and not in the broken character way. He's a fun promo, but like his, even like tackling Ruby, you know, Rebby or anything else was slow and not worth it. Yeah, I already figured that going into this match, I was like, okay. This is going to be an interesting watch, but I figured I was like, well, we know Moose is definitely retaining. No, oh, 100%. But I was just like, all right, let's see what they can do. I want to preface by saying this again. I respect Matt Hardy's contribution to the wrestling world, but there are ways to be a wrestler of a certain age and still be able to do stuff. Again, I don't know what miracle elixir that PCO got going in his veins, but this man like, again, I always bring up the Fatal 4-Way Monsters Ball match at Bound for Glory this past year between PCO, Macklin, Moose, and Rhino. Like, PCO is doing sentons. He is getting thrown into cinder blocks. Some, like, thumbtacks, like... He should have died multiple times in the last yes. couple of years. I mean, technically he does because they always got to reanimate him to come I back to life. But I don't think, obviously, we know that that's not completely real either so no really jvl i had I no idea <laughs> yeah not like his whole family lives like north of me here in montreal seriously but again there was a lot of start and stop between spots moose was doing his best to try to sell for matt hardy but Matt's just not cutting it now moose definitely wins because there was shenanigans system came out the nemeth brothers came out you know, Rev, Rev came out and she, and she got table. spear through a table, which allowed Moose to retain the system, come out and they attack, which then prompts Joe Hendry to come out. And he also gets laid out. I was like, damn, this man can't catch a break. This type pay-per-view. Nope. <laughs> but then the crowd finally came alive. I was like, this is what it took you guys. Really? Whatever. Because then. The Hardy Boys music hits, and who should come out but not Brother Nero, but Jeff Hardy comes out with the chair with his face on it. And then he doesn't do his dance this time. He actually makes his way down to go save his brother. Yeah, makes his way down, saves his brother, throws the system out of the ring, and we have Matt, Jeff, Joe Hendry, and the Nemeth brothers standing tall at the end for against all odds to go off the air. As if they won. Yeah, which was very weird to see. But, and Jamie oh. We made it through against... I deserved this. This is the pay-per-view that I've deserved for missing so much time. Yeah, oh, God. So, I'm going to go give my rating first. You know, again, this wasn't the worst thing that I've seen, but there were a lot of questionable choices and decisions that were made. And, you know, on paper, a lot of these matches should have ended up better than they were. And again, I the direction that we're heading with TNA, I'm fascinated to see where we go. Again, I was kind of excited for Against All Odds, but I was like, okay, some of my expectations were met, but some were not. I'm giving this a safe 7 out of 10 for me. Look, technical, re technical, yes, I knew this is where the fight's going to happen. 
I give this a safe 7 out of 10 for me. I wanted more from Against All Odds, but again, it's not the worst thing that I have seen. There were a lot of questionable, there were some questionable decisions. I feel that certain winners shouldn't have won the way they did, but I got to give it a 7 out of 10 because I didn't turn off my television and throw things at my TV screen. And this is the first thing they get. Well, okay, so let's have this conversation too because I brought this up on, you know, earlier today in a conversation that I had with our buddy Nick when we were talking about this. And, you know, I try to keep a level head here at BC WrestlePod and I don't usually brag and I try to humble myself every chance I get because I don't want to get a big ego. But... I had this conversation with him. I was just like, and you brought this up too, because of this working relationship now that we have established with NXT and TNA or, you know, working relationship, because I feel that it's not equal in both directions quite yet. But I have noticed a lot of content creators, other podcasts who didn't give TNA the light of day are now suddenly reviewing it. And I'm not saying that we're perfect. I have been following TNA for the last three years. I'm still fairly new to this, so I can't really speak on like the golden era that was like the Samoa Joes and the Fallen Angels and the LAX and AJ Styles and all that kind of stuff, right? Sure. Yeah, I know. But the last three years, I've enjoyed TNA because they've consistently have been utilizing their roster to the best of their ability, and they have some talents. I love Josh Alexander. Jordan Grace are obviously at the top of my list. Joe Hendry needs to win matches more, but they also have something with the Joe Hendry, and they utilize a lot of their women's division to the best of their ability with how small the roster is. At least we get more than one women's segment and one match every week on TNA. But I'm just like... For all these newer folks covering TNA, I was just like, this was not a pay-per-view that I would want to show them. I would rather show them Hard to Kill or Rebellion from earlier in the year. Yeah. But that's the thing, Mikey, is that while we would love to do that, as and we talk about this as fans of our other promotions, too, when we bring people in to watch ROH or something, the last couple of weeks have been terrible for ROH and a lot of reasons. And and all the, and it's been ter- it's been big that way for do we promote it? With everyone coming on board this month and TNA ostensibly knowing There are tapings that they had done before running out. We have this chance to really grab an audience that's coming in. We should put our best foot forward. They should have had their best tech people on the ground. They should have triple-checked everything they were doing. They should have made sure that in this relationship and working stuff that the wrestlers they're bringing in could work what they needed them to do, and they didn't. Mm -hmm. So I feel for TNA in this because they can have all those great things that have been shown to all of their hardcore fans and really most of their fans are hardcore fans because no one watches the product you just shot your only shot and it wasn't anywhere near what you needed it to be and me coming into this knowing a bit about the history of tna knowing a little bit from watching one or two episodes i may not have been as upset about it some of the things but i still didn't have fun this wasn't fun for me the only Mm -hmm. fun thing was the Mustafa Ali match. That was a fun match to watch. I gave this one a solid three. And you know what? It would have been a four if the technical difficulties weren't there. And that's not because of the caliber of the wrestlers. It's not because of any storyline things that I had a problem with because it was kind of all blasé in terms of storyline. There wasn't any, like big things I could glom onto, it just didn't hold my attention. Like even not as much as the TNA episode I watched did. And that made me sad. Like I'm not angry about it. I'm not sitting there going like I wasted my time. I'm sad because we're in such a space where wrestling is getting back into the zeitgeist and there's so much competition and good stuff out there. And this company that's been around filling the gap when WCW died and has been the only competition to anybody out there and has held the ground as the alternative is being passed by it's turning into nwa back in the late 90s early 2000s and nwa is even worse off and it hurts me because they've got so much great talent and yes they have a working relationship with nxt but it's not going to be a two-way door and it's not going to help them at all i don't know what their future holds but it's nothing good right now yeah i will say as far as this year has goes i feel that this even though i gave it a seven out of ten because again i love the talent that's involved and ollie and trent seven is probably my favorite match of this whole entire evening yeah i would i will look as biased as i am i have to agree with you i feel that this is the first misstep in terms of pay-per-views for you know dna and that's and which is a shame to say because 
the last five pay-per-views that we've gotten this year have all been stellar. Eights and nines across the board. I almost gave Hard to Kill a perfect ten. I gave him nine and a half because of how right. good it was. But that was buried under all the stuff there, and this is the foot they put forward. So I'm hoping, and again, JBL is done with this, so he doesn't have to come back to TNA. But I'm not me, done. I, I want this to succeed. I'll come back again to see if it is, but this didn't want, like, I'm not going to go out and get my own subscription to TNA+. Plus. I'm not mm-hmm. going to worry about doing anything except seeing recaps on Fightful or anything else at this point, or ours. You know, ch- tune into ours. We'll keep you updated, but, like... I've never seen a company when the lights have been on the brightest fail this badly. Yeah, this was definitely a misstep. And again, with with Victor Slammiversary Road. Emergence and Victory Road, I'm really hoping that Slammiversary brings it because it is a big four pay-per-view and it needs to live up because Hard to Kill and Rebellion have been fantastic. Under Siege in May was really good despite all the changes they had to do with injuries and people getting sick and they still pulled out a phenomenal card this one was a misstep with the tech issues and i was excited for against all odds and while some of my expectations were met others were not so i'm hoping that slammiversary delivers where it needs to because if not i'm i'm worried for the road to bound for glory in november because emergence then victory road we have a pay-per-view in October, but all roads lead to Bound for Glory in November. I just, even if Slammiversary does like record numbers, I don't know if they can recover from this. And honestly, that's why I was thinking to myself, like, why didn't they wait to do the whole open challenge thing and all that stuff with WWE until Slammiversary? Well, that's what I was saying. I thought that that's where we were going. But again, there's too much backstage politics that reeks of this and i'm just like i don't know where this is going but let's see what happens but regardless of this jvl i appreciate you being here because i could have did this alone i don't like doing this alone but no i'm glad to be here with you mikey the only reason i watched this honestly was because i was going to spend time with you and that was that was with the price of admission it makes me feel a little bit better but anyways i have to do this tomorrow with clash at the castle and Oh boy, do I have a lot. We have a lot to talk about oh, with Flash too. I know. Me and Flash wasn't much better than this. Flash was okay. Like the crowd was awesome, but yeah, no, Clash was not. It was slightly better than this. Ro- the the true winners of the pay per view were the ropes. We'll talk off camera because I was. We'll talk. But anyways, me and JBL got to get up on out of here. So <laughs> thank you for tuning into Against All Odds. I definitely recommend if. You're still on the fence about TNA. It's okay. I understand. But at least check out our TNA review. We actually, I think we do a pretty good job of reviewing while also being still keeping a critical eye on it. Because as much as we love a lot of the talent, we are not that often. Take this from someone who doesn't know anything about TNA. Do you want to know what I did to prepare for this evening? I watched our product. I watched our reviews. I got your and Will's take, Andrew as well. And you know what? I was excited because of that. So I recommend highly to you, if you came here through whatever algorithm or just knew we were doing this, keep watching those TNA reviews. Don't watch TNA. Just watch our reviews. Honestly, we'll we'll condense the two hours. We will tell you what you should watch, what you shouldn't. And that rule kind of applies to everything we got here at DC WrestlePod. We are not above critique, which is great. But thank you so much for tuning in to another live review of Grapple Gurus. I will be back tomorrow with the WWE boys of the Professor and Mini. You get the other John. That's going to be fun. Yeah, covering Clash at the Castle for WWE. And the next time you'll see this particular John for a pay-per-view review is hopefully it ends up being really good, which is Forbidden Door. I'm a little, here's why I'm worried about this one, Mikey. There's not enough injuries right now. See, I knew something was missing, but no, in all seriousness, we're actually going into the matches with as advertised because nobody's gotten hurt right now and exactly. knock on wood except we're for Eddie, Eddie that Kingston, way. no one's gotten injured or Eddie Kingston but anyways we're going to get up on out of here so from all of us here at BC WrestlePod remember take care of yourself love one another stay by Conic, and more importantly than anything you always deserve to finish your story and we'll see y'all tomorrow for Clash of the Castle review but Billy until Stark's then outro. yeah Billy Stark's outro ta-ta for now thank you so much for tuning in to another Vibe Tribe production What's going to happen next time? Well, you're going to have to tune in to find out. But until then, remember, take care of yourself, love one another, and as always, make sure that you keep the good times rolling.
Thank you for being here, and we'll see you next time.